Erling has this. Huh? Erling has that, isn't it? Yeah, that's your test. Oh. Yeah. So where are my people? Am I on the wrong thing? Oh. All right, we'll wait for Avery to get logged in. Um, let's see. I'm not able to so, start my video. That's okay. Just um, if you you know if you have questions, just let me know, okay? Okay. So I'm just glad I was able to figure out how to make myself be able to talk. All I had to do was just yes. Headphones, like. Okay. Well, good. Why did those not copy with this set? I don't know. Anyway, sorry, I was at a, there we go. Here's Avery. Trying to make copies. And it was backed up in there and I finally got my copies made. And then, all right. So um, you guys online, I'm going to have to send you guys in just a minute. I'll send you the worksheets that go along with the packet that I sent. Um, now I see what happened with my copies. Hang on just a minute, let me get organized. So um, today our test was due. So y'all can either take pictures and text them to me or email them to me. I don't think I have anything set up online just yet to upload them. I will do that at the break. I'll go ahead and get that set up. So if you need to upload on the site, you can. <clears throat> I uploaded mine already. I uploaded it on the homework. On the homework. Okay, okay, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, that's fine. That's great. All right. So my algebra class was interesting today. Half the class was in person. Half the class was on Zoom. So that was interesting. It was a little chaotic. You'll have to ask your brother about it, Olivia. He, I think they found it quite entertaining. Um, the bad thing is, is the internet connection, we've got so many Zooms going on, so the internet connection may lag a little bit, um, so we'll just do the best we can, um, and then if, if there's something that, if you have trouble or whatever, um, if you have to go back and watch the video, I will be sure to post the video from today, um, as soon as it comes, becomes available this afternoon, I'll get it posted, so, um, Y'all will have that to go back and look at if there's something that you don't, if something starts happening, because I know later on in my class earlier, I guess there's so many people logging into Zoom here because there's so many students out. So the, the internet connection is just not quite strong enough for all that. <clears throat> all righty, so we've got those things that are due today. And then today we're starting our new unit on geometry and that we're, we're breaking it into part one and part two. So in a minute, um, so you guys, I have emailed y'all the packets of information. And so I'm gonna get ready and pass those out in here. So, So I'll go ahead and put your names on them. Okay, so that's your test and all your packets. There you go. All right. Testing packet. Testing packet. Yes, the, the probability packet, yeah, with all the different probability and combinations of independent and dependent. Go ahead. Yeah, you can keep that uh, label this together.
right. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we will be starting with lesson 81. And you'll see that what I've done is I've kind of set things up um, for you guys that we're gonna kind of be taking notes from each little section to help us because we have a lot of vocabulary in these sections. And dealing with geometry um, is, is quite a bit different than regular pre-algebra and algebra and things like that. So that's one of the things um, I teach geometry too. This is my first year to teach geometry. And so um, one of the things I had forgotten from taking geometry as in a high schooler was kind of geometry is similar in that we have some 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 things that are similar with um with algebra but geometry also kind of has its own little set of vocabulary and its own way of doing things um so it's i think one of the things that we struggle with the most in geometry is we're dealing with terms and vocabulary and things that we've never dealt with before so think about in pre-algebra you guys have been adding subtracting multiplying and dividing like since you were little okay this is something you've done year after year after year after year in math so you've previously learned how to um change decimals to uh, fractions and fractions to decimals and percents and moving you know the the decimal to add the percent sign or move it take the percent sign off and make it into a decimal You've previously worked with simplifying fractions. You, you know the terminology. You know that when we say with a product of something, that that's multiplication. Well, in geometry, we've got kind of like a whole new set of words. Now, some of the things like we talk about a point and a plane and a line and things like that are gonna be things, they're gonna be words that you know in dealing with other things, but in geometry, they kind of have a little bit of different meanings. So not only are you learning different ways to incorporate mathematical practices or applications you're learning kind of a whole new language if you will so that's why i wanted to make sure that as we're going through these plus there's a whole new set of formulas that you're going to be dealing with in geometry now sometimes you know perimeter area things like that those are things that we deal with in, in algebra pre-algebra and algebra as well but in geometry we're not just dealing with squares or rectangles or triangles we're dealing with trapezoids and rhombuses and kites and different shapes and things like that so we kind of start going in a little bit deeper so i want us to have a good foundation on starting to learn this because then in two years at the end of at the end of algebra one you have a little bit of geometry um, that you kind of get into but then uh, after algebra one when you take geometry kind of knowing these things now it will help you in the future so we are going to start with lesson 81 looking at these terms looking at these definitions and so you can see that for each word I have a place for you to write the definition a place for you to give an example of what it is and how to write it or how to name it so we'll walk through these and um, look at how we're going to do this so this is lesson 81 on page 179 okay so we can see that the first one says a point is a location in space. It is represented by a dot and has no length, width, or height. Okay, so our definition for a point is going to be a location in space represented by a dot. that has no length, width, or height. That has no length, width, or height. A location in space represented by a dot that has no length, width, or height. Okay, so for my example, this is where I'm going to write my little dot, like the example they've given us, and label it A. And then it says written as just a capital A. Okay, so you guys can see how I've done that. I put my definition, my example, and written as. So for you guys also, I'm just putting my definition, my example, and written as. 
So notice it's got the little dot and then we've named it. So like, like this example with the dot, usually when you have a dot, you're, it's gonna have a letter name. So this one I labeled letter A. So with your dot, make sure you have the little letter A above it because usually what we're gonna see is when, when we are using these, they'll be named. You'll have point A or point B or point C, whatever you've got, you'll know what point it is, okay? So the next one is plane. A plane is a two-dimensional flat surface that extends infinitely in all directions. Any three non-collinear, and that means not on a straight line, points make a plane. All right, so let's talk about this for a minute. So a plane we're gonna write is a two-dimensional, two-dimensional flat surface, a two-dimensional flat surface that extends indefinitely in all directions And then instead of the book says any three non-collinear, not on a straight line points make a plane, what we're going to put here is that three points not on the same line make a plane. Three points not on the same line make a plane. Okay, so in our book, they didn't really give us a, an example. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of draw an example and show you guys um, what, I'm, what I'm drawing. So basically when I draw a plane, it's just gonna be, usually we represent it by a four-sided figure, okay? Because we need to have something to draw on it, okay? So what I do is I basically do like a four-sided figure but then I put three points, three random points on it, because remember we just said that a plane has to be named by three non-collinear points. So if you just draw a four-sided figure and draw three points that are not making a straight line, okay? And I've labeled those points A, B, and C. And then I'm just gonna write that as A, B, C. <clears throat> plain ABC. Okay, so written as plain ABC. Now, one of the things that's hard for me to comprehend, and there's a lot of things about geometry. Um, I think one of the most difficult things about geometry is there's a lot of things you have to visualize, and it is less concrete than thinking about like when I, if I'm adding things and I can actually use little figures to add together or take away or to divide or whatever. One of the things that that's hard for me to comprehend is when we talk about a plane, a plane is usually gonna be a flat surface. Maybe we can visualize like a tabletop, a wall can be kind of an example of looking at a plane. But by the definition in geometry, a plane has no length, width, or height. So you could stack a million geometric planes on top of each other and it has no width, okay? If I stacked a million pieces of paper on top of each other, I'm going to have a big old stack, okay? Whereas a plane in geometry has no width. So I could stack a million of them up and I, they're not going to have a thickness to it. So that's one of those things like, like to visualize that it's hard because I'm used to concrete stuff. When I say it's like a tabletop, well, it is in the sense that it's flat and we have to be able to draw it. So that's why we give it four sides, but realistically, it extends indefinitely and out in all directions, okay? It is infinitely moving out. So when I visualize a plane, I'm, I'm, I'm basically visualizing this four-sided figure laying in the air, going out all directions, okay? So it's a little strange to think about. But one of the things that we can talk about though, is especially if we think about planes like our walls, notice if this wall behind me was a plane and the ceiling was a plane, Okay, so visualize that if our ceiling was a plane and this wall behind me is a plane, 
where would these two intersect? What kind of figure? It looks, it would be like a line, right? So when we talk about a line in just a minute, we can talk about two planes are gonna intersect to form a line, okay? So having concrete things to help us kind of build those pictures in our mind is helpful. All right, so let's look at our definition of a line next. And it says a line is the set of all points between and including two given points and extends infinitely in both directions. Okay, so let's go ahead and write that. The definition of a line is the set of all points between and including two given points and extends indefinitely in both directions. The set of all points between and including two given points and extends indefinitely in both directions. So when I draw a line, this, what I think about is my number line, okay? So think about your number line, how when we have a number line, remember it's got all the positive and negative numbers. And we talk about how the little arrows on the end tells me it extends indefinitely in both directions. But even if I was writing a number line and I have from zero to one, I understand that from zero to one, that includes all decimals and fractions. It's got all those numbers that even if I only have zero one plot all of those little points that are in between are included as well so my example of a line you're just going to draw a straight line with arrows on the end and then you're going to place two points anywhere on that line and i'm going to name mine a and b like they did in the book so i've got my arrow with two i mean my line with two arrows with two given points now i have to have two points to make a line, okay? So I have to have two points to make the line. Okay, so I have my two given points A and B, and I'm remembering that everything that's between A and B is included on that line, and A and B are also included on that line. Now, the way I write it whenever I'm talking about a line, I'm gonna use the points that are on that line. So I've got AB, but then above it, if you look in the book, it has the AB with the little arrows on top of it, the line with the arrows. So what I'm looking at is where it says written as. So this point right here is written as my AB with an arrow with the arrows on top of it. Okay. So that's gonna go in my written as part. I write AB and then I do my, my little arrow above it. Okay. So one of the things that I want you to remember also that not only is a line has points that connect, but we just talked about how two planes intersect to form a line. Now, more than likely, you're not going to hear about that again until geometry. But again, I just want to kind of plant those little seeds. All right, the next is a line segment. Now, what did we say? Why do we have arrows on the end of a line? What do those arrows tell us? What did we say? What was the word that it says it does go in both directions? It extends indefinitely. So even though I can't see it, those arrows tell me that if I could see it, it would go on and on and on and on and on and have no beginning and no end. It's an indefinite line. There is no beginning. There is no end with a line if it has the arrows on the end. A line segment. Look at the picture of the line segment. What do you notice is different from my line segment versus a line? What does my segment have? It has points. It has endpoints. It has a beginning and an end. So a line segment is the set of all points between and including two given points. So my line segment, the set of all points,
the set of all points between and including two given points. And then I'm going to write a semicolon and write each. I'm going to put um, end points show beginning and end. Okay, so my end points show the beginning and the end. So from A to B or B to A, I can see where it starts and where it stops. So that's the difference between a line and a line segment. So my example is I'm going to have my line with endpoints on both ends, and I'm going to label one A and one B. And then when I write it, the written as is a lot like it is as a line, except it does not have arrows above the A and B. Okay, so if you look at the example in the book, it says written as, and it's just an AB with a line over it, no arrows. Okay. So now we've looked at a line that has arrows on each end. Now we've, and then we looked at a line segment that has points on each end. And our next word is array. An array has a point and an arrow. So it has an end point on one end and an arrow on the other. So array is the set of all points between and including two given points and extends infinitely in one direction. So it has in an end point or a, it has a beginning point and then it extends infinitely or indefinitely in one direction. So on one end it stops, but then on the other end it keeps going. So my definition for array is the set of all points, the set of all points between and including set of all points between and including two given points and extends infinitely in one direction. The set of all points between and including two given points and extends infinitely in one direction. So notice I have my endpoint on my example. I'm going to have an endpoint A. It's going to extend with an arrow and then point B. My written as, I write my AB with an arrow on top. So notice one of the things that when I'm naming it, when I'm writing it as AB, I want to make sure that my first letter of my name of my ray right there is where my endpoint is and that the arrow extends over the letter that is closest to the arrow in the actual ray. Okay. So a line has two arrows, an end and a line segment has two endpoints, and a ray has one of each. Okay. So it has a beginning, but it extends indefinitely the other direction. Okay. The next word we have is an angle. And an angle is actually formed by two rays joining together at a vertex. So our definition for angle is when two rays, when two rays share a common endpoint. When two rays share a common endpoint. I'm going to put a semicolon, and after that, I'm going to put the common endpoint, the common endpoint is called the vertex. The common endpoint 
is called the vertex. So when I draw my, red, my um, angle, okay? So when I draw my example of my angle, notice that I've got two rays that join together. They share a common point. So I've named mine ABC. They have arrows on either side. My endpoint is called my vertex. And then when I name it, I do kind of like a slanted L looking shape. So when I name it, I name it angle ABC. Okay. So how many points do you notice we have on an angle? I've got three because I've got one on my top line, I've got one on my bottom line, and then I have one that is the common vertex. I'll have to hold it up and y'all can't see it. Tell me to move it. So it's for a single ray has an endpoint and it has another point going off in the other direction. So when I put the two together, I've got those three points and then I would name it as angle ABC. All right, now one of the things that we notice here when it talks about naming, it says when a single angle is drawn at a vertex, such as the one we drew ABC, the angle may be named as angle ABC or it can be named as angle CBA. In this example, I could name it angle B, I could just name it by the vertex. And so I could write it as angle ABC, angle CBA or angle B. So I can name it starting here, going here, or I can just name it by this angle right here, by the vertex, okay? So I'll go ahead and add those two at C, B, A, or just angle B. So you can name it angle A, B, C, angle C, B, A, or just angle B. Now the next thing it says that if more than one angle shares a common vertex, then you have to name it by the three letters you're talking about. And what that means is like if I were to have, um, I'll draw a pic, Will. Find the back of a piece of paper real quick. So like, So like if I had something that looked like this, where I've got two angles together, I could not name this just angle A because I don't know if I'm talking about this angle right here or if I'm talking about this one right here. So if I have more than one angle together, I can't name it by just one point. I would have to name this one BAC or this one CAD. I have to name it by the three letters because just naming it by the one angle, I don't know if it's talking about the one on the top or the one on the bottom or talking about the whole thing. Because really in this situation, I've got three angles here. I have B, A, C, I have C, A, D, and I have B, A, D. So I've got two smaller angles that added together could make a larger angle, okay? So I've got one, two, or the whole entire thing is an angle as well, okay? So that's the thing I have to be careful about is naming them. If it's more than one angle together, I have to name it by three letters. If it's just a single angle, I can go by the vertex. All righty, my next thing is parallel lines. Parallel lines are two coplanar. Now a minute ago, remember we said the word collinear and collinear means the same line. If I say coplanar, it means they're on the same plane, okay? So again, that plane is that thing that we're visualizing, extends indefinitely in all directions. So parallel lines are two coplanar lines. So the way we're going to write this is going to be two lines in the same plane, 
two lines in the same plane that never intersect. That never intersect. That means they never touch, they never cross over because they're gonna be the exact same distance from the beginning to the end. They're gonna be the same distance apart the whole way, okay? So again, remember parallel lines, lines with arrows on the end, going out indefinitely in both directions, but they're never ever gonna to touch. They're never gonna intersect. So my example, I can just draw a line, I can draw two lines and label one as A and one as B. But then when I write them, I kind of think about parallel lines as like railroad tracks, okay? So think about a train on the railroad tracks. The railroad tracks have to be the same distance apart whether they curve or turn or stay straight. Because if they ever got to where they were a different distance apart, then my train would come off the track, okay? It couldn't stay on the track if they weren't the same distance apart. So when I picture parallel lines, what I picture in my mind is railroad tracks. And it doesn't matter where they go, they're gonna be the same distance apart the whole way because if they are not and they end up intersecting, my train's gonna come off the tracks, okay? And so that's when I use those two lines in between them. I kind of think of like those lines in between my A and B, those are my railroad tracks, okay? So that means parallel. All right, my last definition on here is congruent. The word congruent or congruent figures, congruent figures have the exact same size and the exact same shape, okay? So congruent figures, have the exact same size and exact same shape. Same size, same shape. Um, my example, I could do an example of I can just write angle A, or I'll go ahead and put angle A is congruent to angle B. But notice the symbol of congruence that we use. It looks like a wavy line on top and over an equal sign. Okay, so my example would be angle A is congruent to angle B. My symbol for congruence has a wavy line over an equal sign. Okay. So that's my symbol of congruence. If I see that symbol between two things, maybe if it's triangles, if I have triangle ABC is congruent to triangle DEF, if I have angle A is congruent to angle B, when I see that symbol, I know that I'm talking about the exact same size and the exact same shape, okay? So now what we're gonna do is in the book, let's look at the classwork. And it says, we're gonna draw all these figures, okay? So the first thing it says in the book is it says to draw D, okay? D is a point. So I'm gonna draw my point and label it D, okay? So I just have point D. So I have point D. Um, do you wanna just write this in? Do you have your book with you? Okay, so the first thing is we just draw our point and we're just using basically like our example box is on our notes, except for we're naming this one D. Let's look at the next one. What is that the name of? When I have EF with the arrow on top of it, what am I talking about? A line, good. So I want you to draw line EF. So if you look at your example of a line, that's what you're drawing. Look at your example that you drew with a line and two arrows on the end and then put two points on it. One is E and one is F. And then you're gonna name that one D. So that point, just go ahead and put a D beside it. So that's point D, good. Now you're gonna draw, an arrow, and draw a line like this. And one point will be E and one point will be F. 
And then the next one, if I have GH with a line over it and no arrows, what is that going to be? A line segment. So I'm going to have two endpoints. And what are my endpoint names going to be? G and H. It's telling me I'm drawing line segment GH. So I'm going to have an endpoint with a line and an endpoint. And my endpoints, one will be G and one will be H. All right, what is the next one? Array. Array, good, where it's, a, it's just a straight line on one end with an arrow on the other. So when I look at my example of array, you can either look at the example in the book and you are drawing ray BC. So you can either look at your example or you can look if it's gonna be like this and you would have BC. Ray BC has two points, but the arrow only on one end. All right, what is our next one? An angle. So I'm gonna have angle X, Y, Z. And it doesn't matter if my angle is super skinny. And I have X, Y, Z, or it could be a super open one. And I could have X, Y, Z, or I could have a right angle and have X, Y, Z. So what I'm talking about is I could, those are all examples of angles, okay? So these are three different examples of an angle. When it's skinny like this, this is called an acute angle because it's less than 90 degrees. When it's straight up and down, and side to side, this is called a 90 degree angle. And when it opens up real wide like this, this is called an obtuse angle, okay? We'll talk more about those later. Okay, so those are examples of angles. What does the next figure tell me I need to do? What is the one under angle? Parallel lines, it's like I've got F and G and it looks like I got my little railroad tracks in between them. So basically all you're doing is you're drawing a line and putting a, an F on top of it and a line and a G. And that shows me those are parallel lines. All right, now the next two things, they're telling me things about congruence. So the first one they've told me is I need to show, first of all, what does it say that MN is? MN is a line segment and it's telling me that it is congruent to another line, PQ. So when I look at those, Remember, congruence means same size, same shape. So I'm going to do two line segments that are the same length. And one will be named MN and one is named PQ. So they told me that I have two line segments, MN and PQ, that are congruent to each other. So that means they are the same length. So I put those, I write those for my first statement of congruence. I've got segment MN and then segment PQ, you're gonna draw the same exact length. Like that. Man, and then finally. These look really good. They're, they're like super straight. Uh, why thank you. <laughs> and then finally, what am I saying are congruent? Two what? Two. two angles. I'm showing that I've got two angles that are congruent. So basically you can just draw two angles that are the same size, okay? So we have angle A and angle D. Now since I named them by a single letter, then that means my vertex of the first one will be letter A and the vertex of the other one is gonna be letter B. Was it B? D, sorry. So I have angle A and angle D. And I'm showing that they're the same size. So that's what congruence means, okay? They're gonna look the same. Any questions so far?
Everybody following along pretty well? All righty. So go ahead and turn over to page 180. Look at page 180. On page 180, and actually they should be ringing the bell any minute now. So as soon as they do, we'll take our break. Um, so on page 180 at the top, notice it has three columns, one for figure, one for drawing and one for symbol. So they have given you one piece of information and you have to complete the other two. So what is my drawing? What is that in the middle? What is that a drawing of? If you need to look back at your notes or look back to the page before when it has a dot named H, what is it called? Wait, no, it's right there. Um, it's just a point. It's a point. So under figure one, I want you to write the word point and it's point H. So I'm right here and I just write the words point H. So basically I'm, I'm telling the name of my figure in the first column. Then they gave me what the picture is. And so over here, the symbol, I would just name it the letter H. So my symbol is just a letter H. Okay. So we're going to do this for the rest of this chart. So look, the next one, they have given us a symbol. What is the name of it? A line and line what? Line TV, good. So that's the figure, you're writing the name. So in that first column, you write line TV. So you just write the word line, L-I-N-E, and then TV. Then I want you to draw the drawing of a line where we have a line with the arrows on either end and the, and the points on it. All right, there's the bell. So let's go ahead and take a break. We'll come back and keep working. What did you do to your finger? Oh, I fractured it. Oh, I forgot. I'm supposed to be making y'all wear masks in here. I keep forgetting. Y'all okay. got to. Yeah. They have a pencil sharpener in the office. Yes, they do. I forget because as small as we are and y'all are spaced out, but I still, we still gotta be careful. And
two. Okay, so um, real quick, y'all probably already heard that next week we're going back virtual. I don't know if y'all heard that yet or not. For the rest of the year. Well, just for at least a couple of weeks. And so that's why they're being real sticklers about keeping our masks on all day through class and stuff because um, evidently there were a couple of cases of exposure, I think yesterday, of potential exposure. There was a student that was here yesterday that ended up testing positive um, yesterday afternoon. And so there's two classes that I know for sure are quarantined for today. That's why we've got a whole bunch of people out and stuff like that. So the plan is next week and the week after. So for the next two weeks, we'll be virtual. Um, but then after that, we have our, our winter break. So we're out for a week. It's the week of February 15th through the something. That's our winter break. So we're already supposed to be out the 15th through whatever. So the next two weeks, we're going to be virtual. So we'll just go back to doing what we've been doing. We gave it a good try coming back full time, but it's just not quite the time yet, I guess. So we'll get everybody separated for a little bit, take a little break, and then we'll try it again <clears throat> after, after our winter break. So that's the plan. So, you know, the plan is we'll, we'll give it another shot in a couple of weeks. Um, I know even at my kid's school, my son's in the junior high and he, they got sent home yesterday. He was already home having to quarantine from being exposed. And so, um, so they're, I think they're virtual until next Tuesday, but then the high school is not because the junior high just has more cases than the high school or whatever. So it's just, it's just a up and down everywhere we go. It's always a change. Yesterday I had a doctor's appointment. And um, so it was the kind of thing where <laughs> at this doctor's office, they had everybody in their own little room. So you didn't have like a waiting area and you had to wait in the little room and then they would come get you or they talk to you and then you have to wait in your little room. So it's just crazy everywhere we go. Everything is, you know, but we just roll with it and keep on going. So anyway, um, and, you know, definitely we want to be super careful. Then when we do get to come back again, you know, I'm sure that we'll have things in place about keeping masks on all the time to make sure. And then that way we don't have to worry as much about the exposure and stuff like that. Um, so anyway, we'll just, keep on trying until the silly virus, hopefully we get rid of it or it gets under control or whatever it gets. I don't know. We just, I'm ready to, to be back. The one thing I am very grateful of though, is for us to have the opportunity to come back together every once in a while, at least, because I think about the kids and other, I mean, some other states, like kids haven't been in school all year and that's got to be so hard. I cannot even imagine, you know, the kids that haven't been in school or that have been had to be virtual or with just a computer program and no teachers and all that stuff. So, um, you know, I know it's been a hard, it's been a challenge as a student and I know it's not the easiest thing to learn math over the internet. I get that. And so, um, so that's why I'm trying to do some things, trying to maybe like doing our note sheets and stuff that'll help you guys. Because I know it's also hard when you study for a test and if part of it's been taught to you virtually and part of it's in the classroom and some of it's, you know, you remember some of it better than the other. So that's kind of, I'm just, each, each lesson, each section we go through, I'm trying to figure out what's going to be the best way for you guys to learn the material and to remember it and have something to look back at and study and all that good stuff. So um, I know it seems like every time I'm doing something different, but I'm just trying to figure out what's going to be the best thing for you guys long term. So, all right, so we are working on our chart and activities too. So go ahead and keep working on this. Go ahead and fill out your chart. We said our, our second row was our line and we named it line, L-I-N-E, TV. And we drew our line with the arrows. Now this next one is segment RT. So draw a segment with endpoints, name one endpoint R and the other one T. If you need to flip back and look at your examples or use your notes, segment RT. I'm gonna have two endpoints. One was labeled R and one is labeled T. <clears throat> and then the symbol for it is going to be the letters RT and it just has a line right over the RT. Okay, so my symbol is kind of like TV is right above it, except it does not have the arrows on the end. It just is going to be RT with a line. So see how TV is, Olivia? In the, yeah, so just right underneath it, you're just going to write RT. And you're going to do a line above it, no arrows. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Then the next one is Ray WX. So you're just going to write it out with the word Ray, R-A-Y, WX. Then you're going to write your, you're going to draw your Ray. And remember, if it is named as WX, then the W is going to be my endpoint. 
the X will be another point on the line close to the arrow. So ray W X. All right, what's my next one underneath it? What is that symbol? Angle. angle, good. So you're gonna name that angle. And what letter is the vertex named? P, so we have angle P. So for the figure, just name it angle P. And then for the symbol, we just do the little angle symbol with a capital letter. So it's gonna be angle P. And so. And then the last one, what do we have? Parallel lines. Parallel lines, M and N. So I'll draw my lines. I'll label one M and one N. And then when I name it, or when I write the symbol, I'm going to have the lowercase M and N with the railroad tracks in between them. Okay. All righty. So one of the things that we're going to do for our homework is we're actually going to do activities three, four, and five is going to be review. Let's look at activities three. Notice it says to solve. And you can see that I'm dealing with the same numbers, but just with different signs and symbols. So the first one I have nine minus 11 minus 18 plus the absolute value of three minus seven. What does the absolute value mean? When I have those absolute value symbols, what does that mean? You might remember. So basically when I have my absolute value symbols, what is, what is three minus seven? So inside three minus seven, I'm gonna come to the board and I'm gonna turn around real quick. I kind of treat my absolute value symbols like parentheses in that if I have work to do inside them, I'm going to complete those operations, okay? All right, so for this is activities three. I have nine minus 11 minus eight plus the absolute value of three minus seven. And sorry that it's flip-flop for you guys. All right. So when I'm looking at this, remember my order of operations? It's actually what is, my, what is my list of letters that I use for order of operations? What, it's you say not flopped. Yeah. Oh, is it not? Is it straight for y'all? Yeah. Okay, cool. I always think, because I guess when I'm looking at it, it's backwards on the screen, but if it's straight for y'all, then yay. All right. So when I'm looking at this, you know, I remember PEMDAS? Parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. Okay. So when I'm looking at this, remember the P for PEMDAS. P stands for parentheses, but it can also mean other symbols of grouping. So I can see that I do have parentheses here. So I know that that's going to be something I need to take of in the beginning, take care of in the beginning. But my absolute value also is a symbol of grouping. I need to deal with what's inside here before I can deal with what's outside of it. Okay. And remember when I have the absolute value of something, so like the absolute value of negative one, do you remember that absolute value is the distance from zero on the number line? So if I have a number line and I have zero here and I have one and I have negative one, how far is negative one to zero on the number line? How many places is it? It's just one place, right? So when I talk about absolute value and I'm talking about the distance from zero on the number line, the distance from negative one to zero on my number line is one, just like the distance of one is one. So no matter what is on the inside of my absolute value, I'm talking about distance from zero. And remember, distance cannot be negative. The only time I'm gonna have something negative is if I had the opposite of the absolute value of one. The absolute value is one, the opposite of one is negative one. So in that situation, I would have a negative, but it's because it is outside the absolute value symbol. So let's look back at this problem right here, okay? I have nine minus, what is 11 minus eight? Wait. 
three plus the absolute value of what is three minus seven? Three minus seven, what kind of four? Negative. I start with a three and then I'm taking away something more than what I already have, right? So it will be negative four. So now that that is inside my absolute value symbol, I've been able to simplify 11 minus eight is three. Three minus seven is negative four. It's still inside the absolute value symbol. So I'm gonna work here and I've got nine minus three plus, what is the absolute value of, of, four, of negative four? From zero is negative four. It's four places. So it comes out as a positive four. Is everybody good with that so far? Awesome. Now I have subtraction and addition. How do I know which order to go in? What do I do if I have both addition and subtraction in the same problem? Whatever comes first. I'm going to go from left to right. So I'm going to start with nine minus three is six. six. And then six plus four is 10. Okay. So we took care of what was in parentheses and we dealt with what was inside absolute value, but I went ahead and kept them in the next step. I kept my answer in parentheses here, kept my answer in absolute value. Then I took care of it and solved. So that's what you're gonna be doing in activities three. But notice what they've done is they've changed some pluses and minuses around. Okay, so you're gonna to have to pay close attention to that. Look at activities four. Find the mean, median, mode, and range for your set of numbers. So you've got a set of numbers, mean, median, mode, mode, and range. And then activities five, dividing fractions. Let's review this for just a minute. This is activities five, dividing fractions. Okay. What do I have to remember to do when I'm dividing fractions? I'll do the first one. I have 14 over 27 divided by 35 over 36. Can I divide fractions as it is? No, what do I need to do? I remember keep, change, flip. I keep my first fraction exactly as it is, 14 over 27. What do I change my division sign? Change it to what? Multiplication. I change from division to multiplication and then I flip my equation. I take the reciprocal. So now 36 is my numerator, 35, is my denominator. Keep, change, flip. Now, before I multiply, I want to see what I can reduce here because multiplying 14 by 36 and 27 by 35, I'm gonna end up with some big. So I wanna go ahead and reduce before I multiply. Remember that I'm looking to see, is there anything in the numerator that is divisible by something that will also divide into the denominator? So let's think about the number 14. What are my factors of 14? What times what is 14? Seven times. Seven times two, okay, good. So seven times two, is there anything in my denominator that is divisible by either seven or two? Is 27 divisible by two? Is it divisible by seven? Nope. Is 35 divisible by two? Nope, is it divisible by seven? Seven times what is 35? Five. So 14 divided by seven is two. 35 divided by seven is five. So now I've been able to simplify that. Okay. Now let's look at 27 and 36. What are my nine goes into both of 36? Nine goes into both of them. Good. 36, I could do six times six and four times nine. So when I look at 27, I say four, six or nine. Nine will go into both of them. 27 divided by nine is three. 
and 36 divided by nine is four. So now we can see I've got simplified numbers. So I multiply numerator by numerator. So two times four is eight and three times five is 15. And there's my final answer. It's a whole lot easier to multiply two times four than it is to multiply 14 times 36. So simplifying helps us make it easier. The main thing to remember though, is that when I'm canceling, I can only cancel something in the numerator with something in the denominator. I cannot cancel from side to side, only from top to bottom, okay? So that's gonna be in activities five. You'll have those three problems. We've already done the first one. So do the next three for activities five. So we have finished activities three. We've got activities four and activities five. Any questions so far? All right, now we're gonna move on to lesson 82, parallelograms and rhombuses. All right, parallelograms and rhombuses. So I'll just move right here in case I need the board for anything. All right, so go ahead and turn your page in your packet. We can see that lesson 82 is on the back. On the back of our first page. Lesson 82, parallelograms and rhombuses. And the first thing says a polygon is a closed figure with three or more sides. So that's the first one. A polygon is a closed figure with three or more sides. A polygon is a closed figure with three or more sides. So what it means by closed is that all sides end up joining up together. So like if I had, um, okay, so like my angle is not a polygon because it is not a closed figure. If I add a side on it now, it becomes a triangle. It's a closed figure. That's a three-sided polygon, and that's a triangle. So when it talks about closed figure, it means that all of my sides end up meeting at some point. Now, notice it also says sides. What is that? Not a very good one, but what is that? A circle. That is not considered a polygon because it does not have sides, okay? A circle doesn't have sides. So it is not a polygon. It's a shape, but not a polygon. A so a polygon is a, is a, a circle is a circle, that's right. So a polygon has sides, it has at least three, it can have more. What's a four-sided polygon called? I could have it as a square if all my sides are equal, or a rectangle, and a little bit. Um, we're gonna talk about a parallelogram. And then a rhombus is gonna look like a slanted square. That's not a very good one. So a rhombus is like a, a slanted square and a parallelogram is like a slanted rectangle, okay? All right, so the first one we said a polygon is a closed figure with three or more sides. Our next one, a quadrilateral is a polygon with exactly four sides. So a quadrilateral is a four-sided polygon. And in parentheses, you can go ahead and put square, rectangle, parallelogram, rhombus. If you wanna go ahead and put some examples of a quadrilateral. It's a four-sided figure a four-sided polygon. Now notice the next sentence says, the sum of the interior angles of a quadrilateral is 360 degrees. So I'm gonna put a semicolon after I put my definition and put the sum of interior angles is 360 degrees. What that means is when I talk about interior angles, these two angles 
are congruent. And these two angles are congruent. And so remember a minute ago, we talked about how congruence means same size, same shape. So these two angles of a parallelogram are gonna have the same angle measures. So opposite angles have the same angle measure. But if this was angle one, and this is angle two, and this is angle three, and this is angle four, whatever the measure of these angles are, when I add them together, it's gonna to equal 360 degrees. So angle one plus angle two plus angle three plus angle four is equal to 360 degrees, okay? Again, something that we're learning now, we'll definitely talk more about it one day in geometry, but just to kind of give you, get, give you some information about it, I have my sides that make up my figure and on the inside, I have these angles because remember a minute ago, we talked about when I have two rays that join. So it's kind of like I've got this ray here and this ray here and it joins to form that angle, okay? But then I actually have two other rays that join and make the entire figure. Okay, so our next term is parallelogram. A parallelogram is a quadrilateral with two pairs of parallel sides. So a parallelogram is a quadrilateral with two pairs of parallel sides. Now, what did we just talk about parallel means? Remember when we talked about parallel just a little bit ago when we talked about parallel lines? Think about our, our railroad tracks. Well, let's look at this real quick. If I have this figure right here, again, not perfect. Let's say this is A, B, C, D. Okay. So do you see that this right here, I would name this side AB. Is everybody good with that? Now, what side is AB parallel to? If this is one of my railroad tracks, where's my other one? CD, awesome. So this is my other parallel side right here. So AB is parallel to CD. Is everybody good with that so far? That's my first pair of parallel lines. Now my other one is going to be AC. So if I have AC, what is that going to be parallel to? BD, good. Okay, so this is a pair of parallel lines. Now one of the things that you'll learn later on, again, I can put little arrows like that. And this shows me that these two lines are parallel to each other. Then I could have two arrows going this way. And it shows me that these two are parallel to each other. So I have different ways of marking things up. And we're going to be talking about how to make congruent angles and congruent sides and things like that. But the little arrows like that show me parallel. So I can see that because this has two, this one has two. So those are parallel. This has a single angle, this one has, I mean, a single arrow, this one has a single arrow, so those are parallel, okay? Remember, parallel lines are the same distance apart, so they never touch. All right, so that definition, a quadrilateral with two pairs of parallel sides, and so we see the figure below. Now, I don't know about your book, but my book has a typo in it. If you look at where they wrote AB is parallel to DC, it also says A, B, and D, C for the other one. <laughs> okay, that's what I was going to say. My book has a typo where it just says the exact same thing. So it should be A, B is parallel to D, C, and A, C is parallel to B, D. Okay, so anyway, um, actually, it won't be that because I, name, I named mine different than the book. Okay, so in this one, they have A, B, C, D. So... Um, let me just go ahead. Let me fix mine real quick and I'll name it like the book. That'll be better. Okay, so A, B, C, D. So we said A, B is parallel to D, C and A, D is parallel to B, C. 
There we go. So that's what it should say in your book. AB is parallel to DC and AD, AB is parallel to DC, AD is parallel to BC. All right. So it says, notice that the opposite sides are not equal in length, but the adjacent, I'm sorry, notice the opposite sides are equal in length, but the adjacent sides are not. All parallelograms have opposite sides that are parallel and congruent. Adjacent sides may be congruent or unequal. Okay, so basically, I know with my parallel, these two are going to be congruent. Sometimes these are will not. What is our time? 203. All right, our next term is rhombus. A rhombus is a parallelogram with four congruent sides. What did we say congruent means? Same size, same shape. So that means the length of each side is exactly the same. So a rhombus is a parallelogram. A rhombus is a parallelogram with four congruent sides. So that's why I always think about it like being a square that's kind of slanted because the, all the sides are equal with a square, same thing with a rhombus. But it says, because a rhombus is a parallel, I'm sorry, because a rhombus is a parallelogram, the opposite sides are parallel. So a parallel with four congruent sides whose opposite sides are parallel. Opposite sides are parallel. Okay, the next thing says all rhombuses are parallelograms, but not all parallelograms are rhombuses. So think about if this is a parallelogram and this is a rhombus, then this is a parallelogram, but this is not a rhombus, okay? So if I have a parallelogram that has four congruent sides, it's a rhombus, but if it does not have four congruent sides, then it is just a parallelogram. All right, the next thing says to find the perimeter of a parallelogram. Let's stop and talk about perimeter. What is perimeter? What is the perimeter of something? See if I remember. Okay, so the way I remember the difference between perimeter I'm going to pretend like this is my backyard and I've got a fence going here. Okay. And so obviously it's not going to be perfect, but I'm going to pretend. So if I'm looking at my fence going around the yard, that's like the perimeter. Okay. So perimeter goes around the outside. So if this side was seven and this side was four and this side was seven and this side was four, to find my perimeter, I would say seven plus seven plus four plus four equals 14 plus eight, which equals 22, okay? So my perimeter is the distance around a figure. So with a parallelogram, Notice that I've got two numbers or two pairs of numbers that are the same. Because remember, this side is congruent to this side. So I'm going to call those the length. Okay. So I have two lengths. So if I said this is a length, and this is a length, and this is a width, and this is a width. So my formula for perimeter can be two times the length plus two times the width equals perimeter. All right, so look at our next bullet point. It says to find the perimeter of a parallelogram, find the blank of the lengths of the four sides. So find the sum, we add them together. So find the sum of the four sides. Now, like we did here, I did seven plus seven plus four plus four. What did we say my length was here? What do we say the length was? So I could have two times seven 
plus two times four. What is two times seven? 14 plus two times four is eight. So it's still 22, right? So I can either add all four. I can do side plus side plus side plus side to get my perimeter. Or I can say two times the same measure of one plus two times the same measure of the other. It's going to be up to you how you do that, okay? But later on in math, as you're going through perimeter, you need to memorize the formula that two times the length plus two times the width equals the perimeter, okay? So it says write the formula for perimeter of a parallelogram. So this is going to be what you write right there. And you can also turn it around where you have P is equal to two times L plus two times W. So P is equal to two L plus two W because I'm doing two times the length and two times the width. And it says where L is length and W is width. So P is equal to two L plus two W. And if you want to go out to the side and write L equals length, W equals width. So that's what I put on mine. So if you want to put that L equals length and W equals width, you can. I just added it right over here to the side after I wrote my formula. So if I had a problem and it told me what the length was and it told me what the width was, I would just plug those values in for length and width, multiply each by two and add them together. Okay, so that's perimeter. Now it says to find the area of a parallelogram. To find the area of a pillar parallelogram, find the product of the base and the height. So what does product mean? So when we said find the sum, that meant I would add, right? So underneath it, I just put add in parentheses. But under product, how do I find a product of an answer? I multiply, right? So that means I'm multiplying. So with perimeter, I add. Now, let's look at this. So I have my fence in my back, around my backyard. When I find the area, I'm looking at how much is all of this that's inside, okay? So basically with area, I multiply length times width. Or you can call it base times height. Same thing. I can call it length or a base. I can call it width or height. It just depends on what kind of figure I'm using. If I have a flat figure, usually like just a rectangle on a piece of paper, I can call it length, time, length times width, or I can call it base times height. It means the same thing. But basically, it just means that I'm going to multiply this side by this side, or this side by this side, but I'm just basically multiplying length and width. So in this example here, the area equals length, or we'll say base times height. So that equals seven times four, which equals 28, okay? So with area, I add everything up on the outside to find, I'm sorry, with perimeter, I add everything up on the outside to find the distance around my figure. The area is the distance inside my figure, and that's where I multiply. So that's the difference between perimeter and area. So if I was looking in the classroom, okay? Painting the walls would be perimeter because it's the it's around the room. What would be my example of area? Look down on the floor. What do we have covering the floor? The carpet, okay? So that helps me when I think about area and perimeter. If I was thinking about perimeter, I'm looking at the walls in the classroom. I'm looking at painting the walls. When I look at area, I'm thinking about putting down carpet. Or you can think of a backyard. Your fence around it is your perimeter, but all the grass in between is your area. So those are going to be two, time, two kinds of things to help you think about perimeter and area.
All right, and then the last thing we have, um, it says to write the formula for the area of a parallelogram. And so go ahead and write that where A is equal to, you could either have L times W or A is equal to BH. And you can put B equals base and H equals height. Okay, so that's what I put on that one. So when I wrote my form, I have area equals either base times height or length times width, either one. And I went ahead and made a note out to the side that B is base, H is height. We've already talked about L and W or length and width. All right, so now let's look at classwork one. Classwork one says list everything you know to be true about the diagram below, include the perimeter and the area. So let's look at this figure. What do I notice about the measures of each side? Mm -hmm. sure. What do I notice about the measures of each side? They're the same. So what kind of figure do I have? It's a rhombus. It's a rhombus. We just learned that a rhombus is a four-sided figure and all four sides have the same length. So since I know that the top and the bottom are going to be congruent, the top is three, so the bottom is three. One side is three, so the other side is three. Okay, so the figure is a rhombus. But if it is a rhombus, what other kind of figure is it? It's a parallelogram, good. And if it's a parallelogram, what other kind of figure is it? What was our first word at the top of our page? A quadrilateral. It's a polygon, okay? So it is a polygon that is a quadrilateral that is a rhombus, okay? So when I've named it, I've kind of gone from general to specific. It's a polygon because it's a, as a, a figure, a closed-sided figure. It is a, as a parallelogram. I mean, it's a quadrilateral because it has four sides. It's a parallelogram because it has two pairs of parallel sides and it is a rhombus. So it's a polygon, a quadrilateral, a parallelogram and a rhombus. What would the perimeter of my figure be? If I add all of my sides around it, what's the perimeter? P equals what? 12, because three plus three plus three plus three. Three plus three is six, six plus three is nine, nine plus three is 12. So the perimeter or P equals 12. All right. Um, let's see. Notice what it says underneath my figure. What does it say a parallelogram with the height of 2.5? Okay, what I want you to notice there is it tells me this right below my figure. It says my height is 2.5. The place I find that height is that little dotted line right there that has an H. So I can go ahead and write 2.5 by my H. Okay, so if I wrote 2.5, five on the H. Think about what is my formula for the area of a parallelogram? We said area equals what? So in this situation, what does it say that the height? The height is 2.5. What is the base? Three. So in that, I'm going to have A is equal to three times 2.5. So that's going to be my formula. Notice I have my formula where I have area equals base times height. So I put in three for the base and 2.5 for the height. So when I multiply three times 2.5, think about um, what is, what's three times 0.5? What's three times five? 15, so three times 0.5 is gonna be 1.5 and three times two is six. So what's six plus 1.5? 7.5, okay? So my area of my figure is 7.5. Now, one of the things to talk about real quick, 
is that if they do not tell me a unit of measurement, if they don't say I'm dealing with inches or feet or miles or whatever, centimeters, millimeters, the way I describe these at, or as units, okay? Anytime I'm dealing with distance and length and height and width and things like that, I need to have some type of unit of measurement. But if they did not specify what it is, I just call it units. So for regular perimeter, my perimeter is going to be 12 units, but my area is seven and a half square units. So you can see where I've written that. So in my book, I've written the figure as a parallelogram. It's a rhombus. Um, we know that it's uh, opposite sides are congruent. The four sides equal three. Perimeter is 12 units and the area is seven and a half square units. Okay. So that's all that we know about that one figure. Okay, so let's look at it again. So Olivia, what we were talking about while you're gone is that in this figure up here, below it, it told us what the height is. And the height is describing that little dotted line that goes from top to bottom. That is marked by the letter H. So that means that that height right there, the measurement is 2.5. So my base is typically what my figure is sitting on. So when I do base times height, I do three times 2.5. And three times 2.5 is seven and a half. Okay, so our area is seven and a half units. Our perimeter is 12 units. And then it says, explain the statement all rhombuses are parallelograms, but not all parallelograms are rhombuses. What is the main thing about a rhombus that makes it a, a parallelogram and a rhombus? I've got two pairs of parallel sides, but what is specific about a rhombus, about the side measures? All of the sides are the same length. All of my sides are the same length. All of my sides are congruent, okay? So with a parallelogram, they may not be the same measurement, but with a rhombus, they are, all right? Okay, let's go ahead and look at activities two. Let's look at activities two and look at okay um i think what i may do is wait let's start with activities two on monday okay but i do want you to work on activities three let's look at activities three Let's look at activities three. So notice the first problem, I have three times two X minus three is less than five times the absolute value of seven minus 10. All right. What do I know that I need to do when I have a number outside of parentheses and more than one term inside parentheses? Use the distributive property. Distributive property. This means I have to, I know that parentheses and a number beside it means I need to multiply. Since I have two terms inside, I need to multiply this number by both terms inside. So we call that the distributive property. So what is three times two X? Close, what's three times two? Six. So three times two is six. So that's six X and three times a negative three. What's a positive times a negative? A negative and three times three is nine. nine. So we've been able to simplify three times two X minus three and that is six X minus nine. Our symbol is, is less than Five times the absolute value of, what is seven minus 10? Three. What kind of three? Positive or negative? negative? Negative three inside my absolute value symbol. But when I come down here, I'm gonna have six X minus nine is less than five times three. 
because the absolute value of negative three is a positive three. And when I have a number outside of absolute value, again, I'm treating it like parentheses, so I'm gonna multiply. So I've got six X minus nine is less than 15. What do I need to do to solve for X? What needs to move first? What needs to move from the left to the right? The nine needs to be first. Remember when we're solving for X, we're gonna do reverse PEMDAS. And at the last of PEMDAS, P-E-M-D-A-S, my last two operations are addition and subtraction. So when I'm undoing, I'm going in this order. So the first thing I look at is, is there any addition or subtraction that needs to be undone or anything that needs to be moved? So I'm subtracting a nine here. So to move it, I add nine. So now I have six X is less than, what is 15 plus nine? Five and nine is 14, carry my one, 24. Okay, so we already did undid our addition and subtraction. Now I move to multiplication and division. What operation is happening with six and X? How do I undo multiplication? Division. Division, divide by six, divide by six. So X is less than four, okay? So I want you to do number the second or the, the last two in activities three for homework. Activities two and three. So we're gonna do, we're gonna skip activities two for right now on page 182. So let's look back, let's go page 180. So I'm gonna go ahead and write a, um, a note on my homework, on my notes right here. And I'm gonna put homework. We have page 180, activities three, four, and five. And then we have page 182, activities three. Okay, I'm going to start with activities two on page 182 on Monday. Okay, so remember next week when we go back virtual that you've got links for Monday and Wednesday classes. We're using the exact same links. So I will see you guys online Monday. If y'all have any questions between now and then, let me know. Okay, and I will see you guys on Monday. Bye. Bye bye. Hope everybody has a great weekend.